chapter 54 um, is a chapter that will care, uh, will cover the um, conditions related to um, breast, any type of breast disorder, both uh, benign and malignant. So when we are talking about um, breast, we consider the breast to be part of the female reproductive system. Um, and being a part of the reproductive system, it makes the breast responsive to all hormonal cycle um, uh, phenomenon. And there will be changes associated with every single part of this cycle as ovulation, menstruation, and pregnancy. So when we are talking about the breast, their primary uh, function is the production of milk. Um, and this process is um, referred as lactation. So um, when we are diagnosing uh, conditions of the breast, we'll have some uh, common denominators, will be some types of uh, signs and symptoms that will be um, encountered when we are examining um, females and sometimes even males because uh, breast disorders can be encountered in males also, not only in females. And you will see that they have some um, common denominators as signs and symptoms. And uh, this slide is uh, showing you some of the changes that you may see when examining um, a patient with breast uh, complaints. So um, if you're looking into this, um, one of the complaints, one of the symptoms will be the breast tenderness uh, or pain. Whenever the tenderness is reaching a certain point will be described by the patient as as pain and not as much as just tenderness at that point. We have also um, changes that can be described as a breast mass. Um, and if you're looking to this, you can see that uh, we can describe uh, lumps. Uh, sometimes the masses will um, create a dimpling um, in, the, uh, in the breast uh, structure. Uh, you can see the, you can, we can have what is called a swelling of the breast. We may have uh, nipple retraction or inversion even of the nipple. We may see um, complaints regarding nipple discharge that can be both um, milk or any kind of uh, pathological discharge um, as blood or um, a discharge that can be uh, purulent may have the aspect of an infection. And we may encounter patients that have changes of the skin in the breast appearance that they can be redness, um, there may be uh, changes in the skin texture, and I will describe a little bit later what that means. And you can um, see uh, lymph node changes and um, lymphatic vessels uh, changes that can be visible at the level of the breast. So you are probably used by now to discuss uh, pathology of different systems or different organs in, in a way that takes you from uh, the most um, benign condition to the most lethal ones. And the first one that we'll discuss today is mastitis, which represents itis, it represents inflammation, mastitis, inflammation of the breast, of the breast tissue. So it can occur in one or both breasts and definitely is more common in um, those women that are breastfeeding. Um, however, it may occur at any stage uh, in a woman's life. Uh, it may be associated sometimes with malignancy, but when we are looking at the pure mastitis, this is more common during the second or third uh, postpartum week. So if we need to see what is the pathophysiology of the mastitis, um, well, it's um, a result of a one or more plaque lactiferous duct um, or is a result of an infection uh, when the uh, infectious agent is entering the breast tissue through cracked or fissured nipples. It's very characteristic, especially for those women that are um, breastfeeding uh, until late and sometimes over one year of life when the baby starts to have teeth and they start injuring the nipple while breastfeeding. Also, the ducts may become uh, plugged as a consequence of infrequent nursing or um, as a consequence of failure to alternate between breasts at each feeding. Um, or um, in those cases where the infant is actually not able to uh, latch and suck efficiently. So it's a, it's a weak nursing uh, type of uh, feeding for the baby. So because the lactating breasts have a very complex and very well-developed uh, blood supply, um, and also the ductal system will change to 
supply and support the lactation, um, that makes um, the breast tissue a very prolific, a very good um, place for the bacterial growth. And when an infection develops, usually the most common causative microorganism is the Staphylococcus aureus. Um, and often it can be uh, resistant to antibiotic therapy. And you know this type of resistant uh, staph is MRSA. So sometimes we um, need to teach our patients on how to um, properly hand wash and how to properly um, take care of the breast during the uh, breastfeeding time in order to prevent um, the development of a mastitis. So when we examine the patients, what we'll find is a fever and the general feeling of um, illness, malaise, um, will be associated with that because it's an infection that usually can be hard on the body. And when we examine exact, specifically the breast, we'll see the breast is uh, tender, um, painful, and there is a, an um, extended redness uh, of the breast, like you can see in this picture. Um, at a certain point, if the infection um, continues and develops, the breast will become swollen, firm, and sometimes very hard to touch. Um, we may identify cracked um, or injured nipple or areola, and sometimes as a result of the infection, we may have um, axillary lymph nodes that can become enlarged. And I don't want to say that this is what I can see in this picture, but since I placed this picture on this PowerPoint, I'm always looking on, on this area, and it looks for me like, a, like an enlarged lymph, uh, lymph node in the axilla. However, I know that the lymph nodes need to be a little bit more uh, deep than this, but um, I always look like at this dimple that I can see in this area, and I wonder if it's not a lymph node. So what we can do, we can do, um, what will be the management? So the medical management, and I want you to kind of have a good idea what I mean when I say medical, because we have medical and surgical management. Medical will be that management that will not going to be invasive um, to the patient. Um, so the medical management will um, include drug therapy uh, at least 10 days. That's a full course, and we need to uh, instruct our uh, patients to take the antibiotics as prescribed for the entire treatment period. Um, so usually the antibiotic is from the penicillin group and we can do it uh, if we have um, a patient that has, um, that we can culture uh, and we have a culture and sensitivity, we will do it uh, based on that culture and sensitivity. For those clients that have an allergy to penicillin, uh, usually we can use erythromycin. And for those um, cultures that will show that the microorganism is resistant to penicillin, and usually I was telling you that those uh, staph can be uh, nowadays resistant to a lot of antibiotics, we can use uh, oxacillin or cephalosporins uh, as um, cefazolin or kevzol. And actually those, um, the cephalosporins, they are safe for women uh, during breastfeeding. Uh, Vanco is a very strong um, antibiotic that is reserved for MRSA cases. For the pain, we will prescribe any type of analgesics. Um, local heat can be applied. Now, we need to prevent, in this kind of uh, cases, we need to prevent engorgement and to maintain lactation. So the breasts uh, need to be emptied using a breast pump, especially if the patient will take an antibiotic that cannot be um, um, cannot pa be passed to the to the baby, they will need to uh, empty their breasts and um, do that by pumping and discard the, the milk. Usually a, a lactation consultant will, uh, will help those women and it's a good idea to uh, refer them to a lactation consultant. So we need to teach our uh, patients in terms of nursing management on reporting side effects from medication. And, um, those side effects that we need to pay attention to will be rash, um, gastrointestinal upset, and any type of opportunistic infections in the mouth or vagina. Remember that whenever we are giving antibiotics, there is a high chance that um, will be increased in the yeast, especially in the mouth and in the vagina. We need to be very careful and teach our clients in terms of how to perform hand hygiene before touching the breast. Um, we teach them about bathing and regularly showering and um, how to apply a medical grade 
uh, ointment, usually uh, lanolin, uh, for those areas that are dry and uh, cracked. So we tell them to wear a supportive um, uh, bra, um, a brassier, uh, those special types that are very strong and they can hold a, a breast that is lactating. Um, we will also um, instruct them to avoid wearing breast shields because those usually will become, um, because they are pads and they become wet and they will trap breast milk and moisture and will macerate the skin around the nipple, will just uh, make more harm than help. Um, to um, lower the tenderness and the engorgement of the breast, we can also apply warm soaks to the breast and um, instruct them they can go under warm water for um, to let shower over the breast. And sometimes you will see that um, under the warm shower, they can press on those areas that feel very tender and very hard because usually this is the place where there is a plug in the duct. And under warm water, if they can massage uh, slowly and gentle, the breast, uh, one of those plugs can be dislodged and then um, all the tenderness will, uh, will be released and, and they have an improvement in terms of the pain that they feel. So the question is, is the following statement true or false? Ascitis occurs in lactating women as a result of plugged ducts. The answer is true. And yes, mastitis occurs in lactated women as a result of a plug lactiferous duct, and it will be treated with oral antibiotics and keep to the affected breast. In some cases, an infection, um, a mastitis, can become complicated, and um, then we have what is called uh, breast abscess developing. And this is a localized collection of pus in the breast tissue. Usually is um, the most frequent complication of a postpartum mastitis and pus will purulent, uh, purulent exudate will accumulate in this very localized space. If you can see here, as compared with the uh, picture before that was kind of diffused and the skin was more involved than anything else, here you can see that is the breast tissue and it's very localized. Um, the most common agent for that is again staph aureus. And when uh, we are assessing our patient, um, they will have all the signs and symptoms that we presented before for mastitis. You will have the engorgement and the, uh, the heart tissue and the redness and the pain in the area. And sometimes we may have pus draining from the nipple uh, or from a lesion. Sometimes the lesions will open spontaneously out from the skin, just like an any abscess uh, will do. And we can see that uh, pus draining out. Uh, the diagnosis is made obviously by examining the patient. And in this case, um, usually the treatment needs to be IV therapy. Um, and it's not just medical. For this, At this stage, the medical treatment is not enough. We'll need to do a surgical treatment also by uh, doing an incision and drainage of the, um, of the abscess, an IND. So... Because we have a surgical incision now, it's nursing management. The nurse will be involved in removing and reapplying the dressings. And um, one thing that we need to pay attention, especially if we have patients that will repeatedly change those dressings, is to avoid injuring even more the skin of the breast that is tender um, and very thin anyway by uh, applying the tape. And sometimes we can um, pro avoid use usage of a tape by using a binder that will hold the dressing in place. We can um, apply zinc oxide to the surrounding skin uh, to avoid the maceration, maceration from um, any type of drainage or uh, wound compresses. And also the pain, because most of those abscesses will be on the external quarter of the breast, we can prevent um, the pain that is transferred to the arm by support and the shoulder by supporting the arm and the shoulder with a pillow. The next condition that we discussed today will be the fibrocystic breast disease. And this is also called mammary dysplasia. And when I say dysplasia, dysplasia means an abnormal type of tissue, an abnormal development of the breast tissue or sometimes back in the day, it was called even chronic cystic mastitis. 
And it's a benign condition. And when I say dysplasia, this doesn't mean that there's any type of cancerous or precancerous lesion. It's just a change in the structure, the abnormal development of the breast tissue. Usually it's a condition that we see in women uh, between 30 and 50 hours of um, um, 30 and 50 uh, years of age. And when we um, look at the pathophysiology, uh, the fibrocystic disease is the result, a pure result from hormonal changes during the menstrual cycle. There is an interesting fact that um, the use of caffeine may aggravate the condition and not as much the condition, but the symptoms of the condition. So in the development of this condition, in the woman's breast, in both of them, because usually both are affected with one affected more than the other, will have all those cystic structures that can be single or multiple cysts will develop. And throughout the years, those cysts may grow in size and they may become increasingly tender based on the changes in the estrogen levels uh, throughout the menstrual cycle. And you can see in this picture how the normal breast looks like and how the uh, fibrocystic breast uh, tissue looks like. So those cysts, uh, this process of cyst formation will not want to cease. It continues throughout the reproductive years. And some may disappear and other may become permanent and even grow inside. What's interesting is that the condition resolved completely at menopause. And that's the proof that actually, actually it's a condition that is hormonal uh, dependent. At a certain point back in the day, there was some kind of correlation that some researchers made between fibrocystic disease and breast cancer, but more modern studies and more in-depth studies show that there is no cause and effect relationship between those two conditions. So, however, this being said, a lot of times someone that comes with complaints and has a, a diagnosis of fibrocystic disease at the first presentation may be uh, mistakenly um, considered as uh, a cancerous mass. And now, a lot of times, those conditions will scare the women. And that's because we are teaching them how to self-examine themselves. And um, when they found something that it's tender and it seems like a mass, it may uh, scare a lot of women because they, the first thing that comes to uh, the mind of anyone when you fill a lump is that that's cancer. So what will be the signs and symptoms? Most of the times and in most of the women, those cysts are not big enough to produce enough symptoms. Um, some women may report having tender or painful breasts, uh, one being a little bit more than the other, um, especially uh, when there is a surge in the estrogen. When we examine this type of um, masses in the in the breast, they feel a little bit rubbery and they are movable. They are not uh, fixed to the structures underneath. They kind of um, glide under the fingers when we examine them. And um, what's interesting is that uh, once advised to avoid caffeine, uh, a lot of those symptoms will be uh, decreased or will disappear completely. Uh, most of those cysts will become more noticeable just before menstruation, and they will kind of disappear, um, interesting, will disappear uh, during the menstruation and immediately um, after that. So when some women that are involved in, in physical activity will also complain of something that is uh, called mastalgia or breast pain, especially when they are contracting or uh, moving their pectoralis muscle. How do we diagnose those conditions? So uh, a preliminary diagnosis definitely can be done by examining the breast. So what we'll fill is a, a cyst, a mass that is soft um, and movable um, and will not gonna create any type of skin or nipple retraction. The doctors may uh, perform um, and try and um, aspirate uh, fluid from those cysts because usually they are filled with fluid uh, for a cytologic examination and, and in other situations they may decide that there is a need for a biopsy just to confirm that this is not uh, a cancerous lesion. Uh, we can perform ultrasound and mammography 
um, and usually the um, ultrasound is very diagnostic because it will show that those lesions are very cystic and filled with uh, fluid. How can this be treated? Um, we have both medical and surgical management for it. Um, and any type of uh, mild discomfort uh, can be relieved with um, regular analgesics, um, your regular Advil or aspirin. For those that have more severe symptoms, um, the doctor may prescribe oral contraceptives or danazol, which is a synthetic androgen that will counterbalance the huge amount of estrogen that those women usually have. Um, also, we can prescribe bromocryptin, which is a semi-synthetic ergot derivative that will um, mimic um, a prolactin inhibiting factor. And by doing that is a drug that inhibits the hyperactivity and the hyper response of the breast tissue to hormones. We may remove um, the cyst surgically, um, and we can do what is called a partial or segmental mastectomy, especially for those cysts that are very, very big and are causing a lot of pain. Most of the times, surgical procedures are withhold as much as possible because it's a benign condition and no one wants to remove uh, breast tissue, especially if the breast is very, very small, that will leave the, the patient with uh, deformity. So, um, in terms of nursing management, um, beside the fact that the nurse will obtain the health history and will have to ask very focused questions about the characteristic and timing of the symptoms and find if they relate in any way with the menstrual cycle, uh, we'll also um, teach the patients on how to observe and how to examine the breast um, and how to do the breast self-examination -exam that mainly needs to be done and when to do it and especially uh, teach the, um, the clients on not to do those close to the menstruation or during the menstruation but immediately after. Also um, we'll need to teach the clients on scheduling breast examination by a physician at least every six months uh, or whenever they have a new or unusual lump developing. They may take mild analgesics, as I said before, and they may apply cold, cold compresses to the breast when symptomatic. And if you pay attention, you see that I say cold. For mastitis and abscesses, I said um, hot. We'll teach them to avoid coffee um, and tea and chocolate and caffeinated soft drinks, um, at least for several months, and not just around um, uh, the menstruation, but completely remove them from the patient diet and see if the symptoms will will subside because that's a good trial uh, of treatment. Um, also, uh, they may consult, the patients may uh, consult the physician on taking some uh, vitamin E supplement or oils um, of evening primrose, which is a herbal um, um, preparation that in some clients will um, were found to be very helpful. So is the following statement or false? Fibrocystic breast disease occurs in women of late adolescence to young adulthood. The answer is false, and this is because the fibrocystic breast disease generally occurs in women 30 to 50 years of age. And this is because the breast needs to be exposed for a certain time uh, to um, estrogen variations throughout each um, cycle during each month in order to develop the condition. So next benign condition of the breast is the fibroadenoma, and this is a solid um, mass composed mainly of connective and glandular tissue. And if you remember, the connective tissue is um, that tissue that has a multitude of, of collagen and elastin fibers and only a few cells and have this uh, rubbery uh, elastic consistency. And as opposed to the fibrocystic uh, breast disease, this condition occurs in women uh, during um, late adolescence um, and early adulthood, and only very seldom can be found in older um, adults. So, literally, this the cause for this uh, condition is unknown, and there are some theories um, that are saying that the condition is hormonal dependent because the mass will increase in size during pregnancy when there is a surge in um, you know, sexual hormones um, and will shrink up to menopause when the androgen and estrogen and progesterone completely disappear. 
However, if we are looking at this condition, it's classically uh, shown as a single nodule that will grow very, very slow uh, in non-pregnant women until it reaches a certain size that becomes uh, fixed or stable. And from that point, it will not want to enlarge or regress uh, with each menstrual cycle. It kind of stays the same. And this is another difference from the fibrocystic disease, where those nodules will increase, will appear and disappear based on the level of hormones in the blood. Another difference to compare and contrast with fibrocystic breast disease is that this lesion is painless and completely uh, non-tender. Um, it's usually encapsulated, has a capsule. It's mobile and very firm when palpated. If it shows up and usually, uh, as opposed to fibrocystic uh, breast disease that can uh, usually appears on both sides with one of them being more affected, the fibroadenoma appears in only one side. And if this adenoma will grow very much um, or a lot, it will um, create a difference in size or a deformity or a mass in the, in the breast and they may appear asymmetric. So how do we diagnose it? We use the same type of investigations that we had before. We start by a physical examination of the patient, we'll move into ultrasound and mammography, um, and we can do um, a biopsy. Um, usually it's what is called an excisional, uh, is not just taking a piece of tissue and sending to um, to pathology, but to completely remove the lesion um, and closing the skin over it. Um, the treatment now, um, it's both medical and surgical. It it's based on the symptomatology of the patient uh, and the size of the um, mass. Um, the physicians may decide to continue to observe the mass or to excise them. It's also very much, the decision is very much related to the degree uh, of anxiety that the client uh, presents. If you have a patient that even for a small nodule will be in the doctor's office every month, um, the doctor may decide to just remove it to release the patient from the tension and the anxiety that this um, nodule is bringing to her. Um, nursing management is not uh, a lot different than the instructions from the uh, for the fibrocystic um, breast disease in terms of um, self-examination. Also, uh, we may need to instruct the patient to um, see um, a, a physician every time the mass is changing the size or um, it becomes painful or if the mass becomes um, inflamed, if there is any redness or signs of infection or inflammation around. With the previous condition, we finalized the benign conditions of the breast, and we are moving now into the malignant ones. Um, and under the malignant uh, lesions of the breast, we have the what is called the B category of cancer. So um, the breast cancer um, is definitely a mass of abnormal cells, and the incidence of breast cancer is in decline um, after um, the development in the last uh, 15, 50 years in terms of treatment of breast cancer, um, we see the um, uh, decrease in uh, breast cancer cases um, in terms of the fact that we are using mammography to diagnose those. Um, and as opposed to that, due to an increased incidence of usage of hormone replacement therapy for menopause women, we see an increase of breast cancer in certain categories of females, uh, along with a decrease of risk for heart disease and um, stroke. So currently, if we look at uh, the big numbers, we can say that the incidence um, of breast cancer is one in weight in eight women. Definitely the risk for uh, breast cancer increases with age, and keep in mind that breast cancer is not um, a female condition, it can be seen in males too. And the risk of male is one to 1,000, definitely uh, way, way, way lower than the risk that the female will have. However, when it shows in a male, is way more aggressive. Now let's look um, and see 
some numbers in terms of cancer-related death in women. Um, and the breast cancer is second only to lung cancer. And it's interesting that actually lung cancer kills both in females and males um, more people than any other cancer. For those conditions, for those lesions that are treated uh, early, then they are considered what is called localized. They didn't have any metastasis. The five-year survival is um, almost 100%. It's 99%. If we have any kind of regional involvement of lymph nodes, the survival rate for five years old decreases to 84%. And when we have distant metastasis, it's only 26%. And I want to really quick explain to you what means the five-year survival. It means that um, I'm, if I'm looking at 100 women uh, to date, that they all have breast cancer. Let's pretend that they all have the same stage of breast cancer and they are all diagnosed the same time, and they have they are similar in all the characteristic of the breast cancer. What will be the percentage of women that will survive five years from now? If we are looking at the numbers, how many of those will still be alive in five years? And this means that um, almost all of them, 99% will be alive if the breast cancer was diagnosed very, very early and it's localized, and only 26 will still be alive if they have metastasis. Uh, in terms of pathophysiology, um, there are things that we know that increase the risk for breast cancer. Definitely being female is a risk factor. Being older uh, than 50 years of age and having a family history of breast cancers, um, those are the most common risk factors. Among the hereditary um, risk factor, um, those that are carrier of BRCA1 and BRCA2, BRCA genes, um, and you heard probably of Angelina Jolie that she found out that she's a carrier for this gene and she decided to have a double mastectomy with replacement even before um, developing a cancer. It means that um, there is a high chance for anyone that is a carrier of this gene to develop um, breast cancer at a certain stage in their life. Uh, for those carriers, um, there is not a question of if, there is a question of when. So other uh, additional risk factors will be exposure to ionizing radiation in childhood or adolescence, and ionizing radiation is your regular x-rays. Uh, previous breast cancers, if a patient had breast cancer, they have a higher risk to develop another one. Uh, history of colon or endometrial cancer, it seems like they can kind of cluster together. Chronic alcohol consumption, alcohol is increasing the risk. Early menarche and um, late menopause. Early menarche means um, an early age to um, get the first period and late menopause means uh, that woman will have the breast exposed to estrogens for a very long uh, time and that will increase the risk. Obesity, um, having no children or having children after 30. Um, in terms of um, populations, um, if we are looking into this, white women are at higher risk for breast cancer than African-American. Um, however, when it happens in African-American women, they have a lower surviving rate. So it's interesting that most of the women diagnosed with breast cancer will have none of the above risk, I mean, like none of the the risk factors that I was telling you before, except for the fact that they were female or being older than 50. So let's look a little bit at um, assessment findings and what are the signs and symptoms of, uh, of the breast cancer? Um, interesting, the primary sign of breast cancer is a painless mass in the breast. And usually it will be localized in the upper outer quadrant. Um, the tumor may be what is called developing in situ. Uh, in situ means that it's localized, it's not invading the surrounding tissue, and it may take up to two years to become palpable. So other signs that may increase the susceptibility and, and it makes you think that maybe this is a breast cancer, um, will be a bloody discharge from the nipple, a dimpling, a change in the structure of the skin, usually over the lesion. 
retraction of the nipple, what is called peau d'orange, and this in French means an orange peel. When you're looking at the skin, it looks like the orange peel has um, those pores very visible. And um, it may be a difference in size between the breasts because they may become, um, the lymph um, um, vessels may become engorged because of the um, tumor infiltration. The lesion may be fixed or movable, and the axillary lymph nodes may be enlarged, may be palpable or not. Uh, and all those signs and symptoms may vary depending on the type and location and um, duration of evolvement of the uh, tumor. Just to give you an idea, about 60% of the tumors will show up in what is called superolateral quadrant. If we're splitting the, um, the breast in four uh, quadrants, the superolateral quadrant toward the axilla and the superior part will be 60% with the next one, the next most common will be the supramedial towards the mid chest uh, will be 15% and um, inferior lateral quadrant 10 with only 5% inferior uh, medial uh, quadrant. How do we do a diagnostic? Um, we start usually by doing a mammography, um, especially the digital one is very good in detecting any type of breast lesions very early even before they can be uh, palpated. And uh, it's advocated that um, mammography is particularly good for women with dense breast tissue. And um, a radiologist can, can differentiate between a benign and tumor and the malignant one um, on those uh, mammography, which are plain, to explain this to you, it's a plain X-ray of the breast. Um, the recommendation that for performing it is that in women that are over 55, we perform them every two years or yearly if is needed or it's wished or they have any kind of increased um, anxiety regarding um, some symptoms. Uh, we can do uh, what is called um, an MRI of the breast. And this is the uh, choice investigation, especially for those women that have breast implants. Um, and in the future, we'll see more and more of this type of patients because um, it becomes more fashionable to have breast implants. When you have a breast implant, a mammography, um, the result and the way to read the mammography can be compromised and also um, an ultrasound is not as accurate. So those patients will have an indication for MRI uh, to investigate if they're at a high risk for breast cancer as those that are in a family that they have the uh, BRCA gene. Uh, what's the treatment? So. Definitely the treatment is surgical. Uh, and the type of surgical treatment depends on the stage and the type of the breast tumor. We have more than one type of uh, breast tumor. Um, it will be associated with chemo and radiotherapy. It can be done as what is called a sandwich ther therapy, especially for uh, those lesions that are a little bit um, bigger. And they can um, start with chemotherapy to um, produce a shrinking of the tumor, followed by surgery, followed by chemo and radiotherapy again. Uh, immunotherapy can be added to increase and um, provide a better um, result of the immunotherapy. So the question is, is the following statement true or false? Breast cancer is staged with stage one being the most advanced. And this is false because usually the first stage, uh, regardless if it's breast cancer or any other type of cancer in the TNM, if you remember types of uh, staging, T standing for tumor, N standing for the level of nodes, uh, lymph nodes involvement, and M being the metastasis, uh, the stage one is the least advanced with the progression of stage two, three, and four, four being the most advanced. Now, before going into um, surgical procedures and describing them a little bit, I want to tell you um, a little bit about what is called the sentinel lymph node mapping or um, sentinel lymph node dissection. So there is a theory that every type of lesion, um, no matter where on the breast uh, structure, will have a certain uh, lymph node drainage. And that lymph node drainage 
will go, will train as lymph vessels into one node, one lymph node and one lymph node only. So if I can identify um, while doing surgery that one lymph node and I can send that one lymph node to pathology and the pathologist can tell me if that lymph node is involved or not, I can 100% say that the um, lesion was spreaded from the initial place or not. If the lymph node is clean and no tumoral cells are in that lymph node, it means that the disease is localized, totally localized. If that lymph node is affected, then it means that the lesion spread it out and moved from the original place. And how do we do that? How can we identify that? So what do we do? We usually do a combination of um, injecting a dye, which is usually methylene blue around the lesion um, in the breast. And along with that, we inject um, a little bit of radioactive um, substance. And that will be done before the surgery starts, usually with the patient under anesthesia, and uh, the surgeon will perform the um, removal of the tumor in the breast, and that will take roughly, let's say, up to 40 minutes, one hour. That is plenty enough to allow the lymph node to drain, or the area in the breast to drain both the methylene blue and the radioactive substance towards that uh, first lymph node that I need to identify. And when I'm doing that, I'm using, I'm using either a, a Geiger, a tiny Geiger probe that will uh, make a very um, acute sound when uh, there is a lot of radioactive accumulation in one lymph node. And in addition to that, what I can do, I can um, follow uh, the blue lines that the methylene blue will, um, will color the inside of the lymph nodes that they are almost transparent so I can see the blue in them and I will find a blue lymph node that stands out actually in any kind of uh, surgical wound uh, because usually the lymph nodes will be found in the fatty tissue and fatty tissue is whitish, um, yellowish kind of color. So a blue uh, colored lymph node stands out. So if this lymph node is taken out then this examination is done in real time, the surgery will not gonna stop. This tiny lymph node will be sent out of the OR to the uh, pathologist. The pathologist will look at it immediately and will return the answer to the surgeon. Um, and based on the answer, the surgeon will um, say, okay, so the lymph node was not affected. So we are done. We just removed the lesion. That's all we need to do for now. Um, we may or may not um, reinforce the results by um, exposing the patient to chemo or radiotherapy after that, or we may say that, that the surgery was enough. If the lymph node was uh, affected and there are tumoral cells over there, the surgeon will perform what is called a formal uh, lymph node dissection to remove all those lymph nodes that they may be um, involved in the area. Now let's look a little bit of uh, what options do I have um, in terms of um, performing surgery. I have one option that is called a lumpectomy. A lump is another word for a mass and when I'm doing a lumpectomy, what I'm taking out is just the area uh, that around the uh, lump, the mass that I can see. Uh, we can do uh, what is called a partial or segmental mastectomy uh, when a segment like in a wide excision is removed from the breast with a little bit more tissue around the, um, around the, the mass, around the lesion. We can do, uh, if, if I'm going a little bit bigger than just partial, I can do a quadrantectomy. And quadrantectomies are reserved for those patients that have bigger breasts. If I have a patient that have very small breasts, um, the decision can be a little bit different because just taking a quadrant from a small breast uh, may be a lot of tissue loss and uh, may have, from aesthetic points of view, uh, be a big deal for that patient. And in those cases, especially for small breasts, we may recommend to do what is called a simple or total mastectomy, followed immediately by a reconstruction of the breast. Um, for a total mastectomy or simple one, it's just we are just removing the breast tissue. Um, and for those that have a small tissue, we do what is called subcutaneous mastectomy, which will allow the skin over to 
uh, cover the implant that we are putting um, under immediately. And this is an interesting procedure because a general surgeon was started um, and the patient will not wake up from uh, anesthesia and the plastic surgeon will follow immediately and uh, put the implant in. And sometimes they may uh, put an implant on the other breast too uh, if the woman wants to go larger. So you see, breast cancer nowadays can be a little bit of fun for um, the patients because they can say, oh, so if you're removing my breast now, how about I'm gonna get bigger anyway? Uh, so they can put a bigger size and they can increase with different sizes of um, implants, both breasts. Uh, for those cases that are a little bit more uh, advanced in terms of cancer and I don't have a localized lesion, um, I may need to do what is called a modified radical mastectomy or a radical mastectomy. In those um, resections, uh, what we need to do is not to remove just the breast, but we will remove the axillary lymph node and sometimes the uh, muscle. So let's summarize a little bit the criteria for the mastectomy. Um, usually the mastectomy is um, a decision and it's a procedure that will be performed um, immediately or shortly after we receive the results of a biopsy. And usually the biopsy will be a needle biopsy um, that will just extract some of the cells um, and it's done as an uh, outpatient um, um, test. Again, the type of surgery that the surgeon will recommend to the, to the client will depend on the stage of the tumor and also by the client's informed decision. And I was telling you before about those um, type of decisions that we need to do in terms of how the size of the breast initially is and we can inform the patient on all the treatment options and they will make their informed decision. And very, very important to emphasize is the fact that the current trends is to perform the less uh, invasive type of procedure necessary to obtain a good prognosis. However, we're not gonna keep the resection smaller only for aesthetic reasons and expose the patient to um, uh, metastasis or anything that will um, decrease their chance of survival. We'll do those procedures that are needed and we'll recommend those that are needed to have a patient that is alive and survives the cancer. And probably the most common uh, complication um, during the post-op time will be what is called lymphedema. And that's the soft tissue swelling as a result of accumulation of lymphatic fluid. And that occurs because as I was telling you before, we do lymph node dissections, we are removing those stations, we are removing those channels that are draining the lymphs out um, from the breast. And uh, as a result of that, because we are removing the axillary nodes, they are draining both the breast and the arm. And as a result of that, we may have um, sometimes temporary, sometimes uh, permanent enlargement of the arm and hand on the side um, of the um, procedure. Now, there will be, in some cases, because of lymphedema, they may, there may be a reduced range of motion of the arm, um, the heaviness in the limb, there may be skin changes, all of the result of accumulation and phases of lympha in the arm um, may be predisposed to more local infections um, and sometimes up to tissue necrosis, very rare, but it can happen. Um, so in those patients, please make sure that you are not measuring um, blood pressure on that arm uh, because that will just increase the symptoms and um, the stasis in the limb. Now, before we are moving forward, let's talk a little bit about um, chemotherapy. Um, and the main goal of chemotherapy is to destroy any cancer cell that may have escaped the surgical removal. Uh, when we are removing cancer, we are removing only macroscopic lesions. We don't have a microscope in our eye. We would love to have one, but we don't. Um, and usually we perform chemotherapy with a combination of, um, of drugs, not with just one. So I was telling you that we are staging the tumors and most of our patients with stage one, which is the first stage, the most non-invasive will do perfectly fine uh, with surgery. However, we have enough trials that um, show us that for tumors that are estrogen sensitive, those patients will do better if we are adding to their treatments two categories of drugs, tamoxifen and what is called an aromatase inhibitor, such as Famara or letrozole. 
and I think that you've seen enough um, advertisements of Famara on TV um, because they were uh, all over. Um, and those will increase their chance of surviving for um, five years. Tamoxifen is an uh, estrogen receptor blocker that will block the breast cancer cells uh, from um, thriving on estrogen, while an aromatase inhibitor will prevent free hormones from becoming estrogen. So because of that, uh, aromatase inhibitors are not very effective in premenopausal women because their ovaries will produce more estrogen anyway as a result of a negative feedback loop. Remember the negative feedback loop? The less I have um, something, the higher will be the stimulus to produce that. Um, so what are our options? One type of chemotherapy is called neoadjuvant. And when I say neoadjuvant, it means it comes prior to surgery. And adjuvant means comes in addition, comes to help. Or it can be provided, the chemotherapy can be provided as adjuvant ther therapy or helper therapy as the treatment after surgery. Now, in terms of chemotherapy, we have um, a few options. So we can give an anti-estrogen drug, a tamoxifen, for postmenopausal women uh, with tumors that are hormone dependent. Uh, we can give a monoclonal antibody that binds and selectively inhibit breast, cell can breast cancer cells um, like uh, Herceptin or Transtuzumab. Uh, it's that's the um, uh, the generic name. We can give anti-progestin drugs as uh, Mifepristone, RU486, probably known better as the abortion pill. Uh, that will block the progesterone-dependent breast cancer uh, from um, thriving. And we can give androgen therapy for advanced breast cancer in postmenopausal women. Um, and we can do a single or combined antineoplastic uh, therapy as doxorubicin, uh, cyclophosphamide, uh, paclitaxel, uh, or carboplatin that are combined to reduce the level of um, hormonal dependence of those um, cancer cells. A few words also about the radiation therapy uh, can be also given before or after surgery, uh, especially if the uh, surgeon finds um, axillary nodes that are affected by cancer cells, or if the tumor has invaded the chest wall, uh, or if the tumor is larger than five centimeters, um, radiation therapy uh, will be ordered um, in in um, will be ordered in order to uh, improve the results of the uh, surgery alone. Uh, in terms of other treatments that we can offer to the patients will be immunotherapy and cancer vaccines. Um, that's a whole theory around those that we can use monoclonal antibodies, all those having um, the main role of increasing the immune uh, response and the immune, immune system of the patient in order to fight um, the, uh, the cancer cells that may still uh, exist in the body even after the main tumor was uh, removed. A little bit about the side effects of uh, chemotherapy and that may be um, in, inside this it's the common side effects of any type of chemotherapy like nausea, vomiting, um, changes in taste, um, hair loss or alopecia, uh, mucositis, dermatitis, a general feeling of being very tired, fatigue, weight gain, and in some cases, uh, bone marrow suppression. Before moving into the metastatic breast cancer, I want to um, give you a few words about um, client teaching, especially post-surgery. Um, some of the patients may have um, a drain um, and they may be um, released home uh, for the next um, seven to 10 days with that drain until the surgeon will uh, see the patient in a follow-up visit and will remove it. And the nurse will need to teach the patient on how to care for the wound, how to care for the uh, for the drain and how to write down 
um, to journalize the amount of um, uh, secretions that they will find, the fluids that will accumulate in the drain. Um, also, we'll, as a nurse, you will need to assess the availability of family assistance at home. A lot of times, I was telling you about the involvement of the arm, especially if it's the dominant arm, may be a problem for the women to be able to perform a lot of the uh, household duties or to even care for themselves, depending on how old they are. Keep in mind that it's a condition that can uh, um, show up in, in um, older women and um, they may have other um, associated uh, conditions, not just the breast cancer. They, uh, you need to, tell, to teach the patient in terms of how to look for and report any signs of infection or any kind of impaired wound healing as such as drainage or um, a dusky or very pale skin um, and provide instruction on how to perform arm exercises um, in terms of improving the function of the arm. And there are a few exercises that are very easy to be done and they don't need any kind of equipment can be done at home and can be started even um, in the first uh, couple of days if the uh, patient was uh, hospitalized for more than 24 hours. The first one will be the wall hand climbing where the patient standing facing the wall um, will um, have their palm of the hand placed on the wall at the shoulder level. And by flexing the finger, we'll work the hand up the wall until arm is fully extended and we'll come back, we'll reverse the process working the hand down to the start point. Uh, we may have the rope turning where they have a, a light rope um, tied to a doorknob and they will stand facing the door, will grab the free end of the rope in the hand, uh, definitely with the hand where they had the surgery, and place the other hand on the hip. And with the rope holding the arm extended and held away from the body, almost parallel to the floor, they will need to turn the rope, making as wide swings as possible, like you were doing it as a child when you were um, jumping the rope. Um, they need to start slowly and to increase the, the speed um, and throughout uh, the same exercise or maybe later the next day or the next couple of days in terms of uh, what are they able to do. Um, another type of exercise that they can do is called a rod or a broomstick lifting. And they grasp the rod with both hands and they kind of held it, um, they held the arm kind of two feet apart and keeping the arm straight, they will raise the rod over the head they will bend the elbows to lower the rod behind the head as much as possible, and they will reverse the maneuver um, uh, coming back to the starting point. And the last one will be um, pulley tugging. Um, that will be a, a rope that will be tossed over a shower curtain or a doorway curtain. Make sure that if they're doing that, the, the uh, shower rod or um, the doorway rod, they are really well uh, in place fixed because they can... Um, an accident can happen if, they, if that falls. And um, the patient needs to stand as much as possible under the rope and they will grasp both ends and will extend the arm straight and away from the body and will pull the left and the right, uh, kind of sliding the rope over the rod and um, making as wide movements as possible at the level of the shoulders. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about the metastatic breast cancer. And um, in terms of uh, pathophysiology, um, the metastatic breast cancer is most commonly seen at the level of the lymph node. Um, and despite the fact that we are trying to identify the um, disease as soon as possible um, in the early stages, and despite the good treatment and the correct treatment that was applied to some of the clients, they may develop metastatic disease. And, and as a definition, uh, metastasis is the uh, movement, the migration of cancer cells from where they started from the tumor to any other part of the body. And different cancers will have different affinity, will have different preferences for different organs in our body. So when we are looking at malignancy spreading, we can say that it spreads by direct extension. It will involve the structures around. And if you look at this, um, picture over here, you can see that the tumor can invade the structures around, they can invade the skin or can invade the muscle, and that's the direct extension um, of a tumor. They can um, invade through the lymphatic system uh, once the uh, tumoral cells are spread through the lymphatic vessels or through the bloodstream or um, into the cerebrospinal fluid even. 
So I was telling you that is um, lymph nodes are the most commonly involved. Uh, however, metastasis for breast cancer can be found in brain, um, adrenal uh, glands, um, in the liver, and in the bones also. Um, none of the rest can be found in, in lung also. Those are the most common uh, places for uh, metastasis. Uh, what we'll find in terms of um, signs and symptoms? Well, the metastasis will produce uh, mainly pain at the new site, and the symptoms will be related to the organ that is involved. If it's a, uh, if it's a brain involvement, usually you, you may have a patient that will show in all kinds of neurologic symptoms and usually will be a new uh, onset um, um, seizure type of um, symptoms. And while doing a CT scan, we discover the metastasis. If it's bones, it may be a fracture, which are called pathological fracture because they um, appear as a result of a metastasis, inva a metastasis invading the bone. How do we diagnose metastatic um, cancers? Uh, we use imagistics. Um, that can be as simple as, um, as x-rays for the bones. Um, we can do MRIs and CT scans. Uh, depending on the level of involvement, um, different organs may have different ways of getting there and making the, uh, the diagnosis. Um, for the treatment, depending on the extent of the condition, uh, there may be an option for surgical procedures, uh, chemo or radiotherapy for those um, metastases. Um, however, for those that are a little bit um, advanced, more uh, that there are advanced cases, uh, what we can do is called palliative treatment, just um, offering a good quality of life and um, lack of pain for those patients. So just to summarize uh, a little bit the um, types of treatment that we can uh, offer for uh, breast cancer, we have chemo and radiotherapy um, associated with surgery. And, and to kind of uh, put them in the, the respective categories, we have what is called the local therapy, that is the surgical and radiation therapy that works locally on the tumor. And we have what is called systemic, and it's given systemic, it's, got, it's given to the whole organism, is the hormonal, chemo, and targeted um, therapy. Before moving forward, a few words about breast cancer prevention. And there are a few options that are available for women that have an increased risk for uh, developing breast cancer. And um, one will be the long-term follow-up. Um, it means that they are very much aware of self breast examination. They perform their mammographies in time. They are in close touch with their physicians um, in order to be able to diagnose if it happens, a lesion at um, a very uh, very early stage. They can do what is called a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy, or they can do what is called a chemo prevention. And usually chemo prevention is uh, reserved for um, those cancers that were removed uh, surgically and we are preventing the recurrence of the disease. And the chemo prevention can be done with uh, tamoxifen or um, Bomar. So we are looking into annual mammographies or MRI, again, if they have breast implants, um, and we know by now that the use of tamoxifen will reduce the occurrence of estrogen receptor positive tumors. However, they do not affect the occurrence of estrogen receptor negative tumors. So we need to know the type of tumor before we are recommending a certain type of treatment um, to a, a client. So regardless if we are talking about um, a cancer patient or someone that doesn't have any other conditions, we have a few cosmetic breast procedures that we, I will try and summarize them for you. So um, let's talk a little bit about what is called the breast reconstruction. And usually breast reconstructions are reserved to those patients that went through a mastectomy. Um, they had some kind of mutilating surgery that they are drastically and dramatically change the aesthetic aspect of um, their torso. So in a breast reconstruction, the, um, the surgeon what will do is to uh, simulate and reconstruct the um, normal aspect of the breast. So depending on what type of surgery, and look at this picture for a second, you can see that this patient um, did have uh, a mastectomy, 
uh, it was not what is called a subcutaneous mastectomy. All the breast was removed together with the um, with the skin. So and also has for the other breast, it has what is called a ptosis. It's not um, a nice and round and perky type of breast, but it's kind of uh, laying low. So for this patient, if you see the result here, not only that they put in an implant and they reconstructed and recreated completely from zero the nipple and the nipple and the um, the areola, but they also provided a lift for the other side, and and you can see how nice they look right now. So what will be the options that we have? We have um, an option that is called an artificial implant, and the artificial implants can be saline, can be silicone, but the silicone we are kind of dropping them lately because they had high complication rates, and uh, there were some issues um, with the FDA approval. So uh, for um, in order to be able to use uh, an artificial uh, implant, I will need to create the first stage of this procedure will be to recreate a pocket and to expand the skin because we need the skin. Can you see that this patient actually um, has its, her own skin? And what was done with this patient, and a balloon was implanted under the skin and through a matter of weeks through months, that balloon was inflated slowly in order to expand the skin and allow the skin to reconstruct the pocket where the implant will be able to be uh, to be placed uh, nicely. Now, another procedure that we can do is what is called an autogenous tissue, and they have a more natural look and feel, and usually they come also with um, the skin. And we have two options for that. We have the option of rectus abdominis, uh, muscle and we have the option of latissimus dorsi flap. So the muscle can be taken from this area, uh, from the abdominal area, or can be taken from the back, from the uh, latissimus dorsi. For those patients that do not have any kind of cancer, but it kind of relates to the ptosis, what I was showing you uh, before, we have uh, what is called reduction uh, mammoplasty, and you can see how those breasts are both. Um, big and heavy, and uh, because of the heaviness, they don't have a, a, a nice and perky look. So who will have a recommendation for reduction mammoplasty? And usually the patients will look for this um, type of procedures uh, because they cannot exercise, because they cannot go to gym. It's a heaviness in their um, carrying the breast um, and finding the correct bra that will be a able to support the breast and um, as a result of that they may have issues of back pain because the bra will rely on the shoulder and the shoulder will transmit to the back the, the pain and the um, uh, heaviness. Um, so you can see that what we do, we do what is called the reduction mammoplasty where um, together with the fact that we are reducing the amount of tissue that the breast has and most of it at this stage in life for most of those uh, patients, which are not young patients, it's uh, fatty tissue. Um, they are also um, um, followed by what is called the lift. The breast is, is brought up and re-anchored on the level of the clavicle. Also, the last type of um, cosmetic procedures will be um, described in, on this slide. And I was touching into mastopexy before and the breast lift or a mastopexy can be done even on a small breast um, that um, usually corrects the sagginess, uh, a low nipple placement, and usually is reserved for those uh, patients that they had a multitude of pregnancy and they were breastfeeding and sometimes breastfeeding over a year. Um, and as a result of that, um, after recovering after pregnancies and uh, breastfeeding, the breasts show a certain degree of um, sagginess. Um, and if the breast is not big enough and doesn't have enough tissue or the breast tissue, it doesn't have the, the best quality uh, for solving the uh, sagginess just with the breast tissue, we can use what is called a breast implant. Um, and that kind of touches into what is called breast augmentation or increasing the size of the breast. Some patients may want an increase of the size in size of the breast and some may need an implant just to uh, supplement for the lack of tissue um, that was lost in, in the process of all the changes of pregnancy and um, uh, breastfeeding. So um, the breast augmentations we can 
uh, do them with implants um, that, again, they are saline or a silicone. We are not really using the silicone anymore. And the breast implants can be placed, as you can see here, in two ways. They can be placed in front of the muscle or um, behind the muscle. And those that are placed in front of the muscle, depending on the shape of the uh, silicone implant, because some are pure round and some may have a teardrop uh, shape and they look a little bit more natural, all of those that are placed in front of the muscle, they have this kind of unnatural. Um, and, and it's very obvious that this woman had a, a, a breast um, implant uh, procedure. While those that are pl placed behind the muscle, they, they do tend to be more tear, teardrop shape and have more natural um, and more um, eye pleasant type of um, aspect. So a little bit about the breast implants in terms of um, the nursing uh, management and what we need to advise our patients is in terms of pain management, it's just um, like any um, other procedure, there is an incision, there, is, there will be some pain. Uh, what we need to advise our patients is that they have to wear the the, uh, the bra. There is a brassiere that they will need to wear um, for a certain number of weeks and remove it only to take a shower and put it back immediately and wear it day and night. Because if you really look into that, you can see that the implant is it's just under the skin and under the soft tissue. So until the body creates what is called a capsule to keep in place the implant, if they are not wearing the, the brassiere, the result will be bad. This implant will move away from where the pocket where the surgeon placed it. So it's essential for them not to forget and to use the brassiere all the time and do not remove it regardless of what's going on. They really need to do that. Otherwise, the result uh, will be poor. Also, uh, they will be instructed in uh, for the next um, four weeks, four to six weeks, depending on the um, ability of healing, to not exercise and to not lift uh, more than two pounds. They are not allowed to do anything because, again, the capsule is not developed and the implant, because they, to lift uh, something, we are using this muscle. The, um, the pectoralis muscle will, uh, is helping us in lifting and in, in, um, using our arms. So if they are lifting and this muscle contracts, is moving the implant, is detaching the implant, and it's preventing a good healing, and they will have a bad result uh, on the long term, and they will just blame the surgeon while, in fact, they didn't listen to um, what they were told to do.